the early 1900s, and the island of Ceylon is one of the last remaining bastions of the Englishman. World War I sets off an independence movement that echoes across the globe, and British colonies know that change is in the air. India is engulfed in an ideological anti-colonial fervor that will end in a bloody partition. But are the British up for another battle to let go one of its lucrative smaller colonies? Join us as we take the journey of the brave men and women who brought freedom from colonization to the tiny island of Ceylon. At around the same time Michelangelo is carving marble for David and the future King Henry VIII is about to divorce his first wife, a Portuguese trading ship accidentally comes upon the shores of Lanka. Thus begins European colonial influence in the island. From 1505 till 1658 AD, the Portuguese went on to hold significant power over major parts of Lanka when they were replaced by the Dutch, whom Raja Singer II invited as a defense against the increasingly dominant Portuguese. This exchange was to spawn a famous national idiom, Ingurudila miris gattavage, or getting chilies in exchange for ginger. But the sting of chilies would be mild considering what was in store. By 1796, the country is on its third European colonizer, the British. And by 1815, even Kandy, the last kingdom of Ceylon, had succumbed to British rule, ending a 2,300-year-old Sinhalese monarchy and marking a period of total colonization by the British Empire that would last 133 years. By the late 19th century, the British had experienced several minor rebellions along with the quiet revival of Hindu Tamil and Buddhist Sinhala identities in the country. In addition to their well-worn ploys of dividing the population along ethnic lines and selecting a few Eurasian subjects for administrative loyalty, the state exercises strategic control by keeping their colonial subjects drunk and in debt. The men of Ceylon are introduced to plenty of inexpensive liquor in easily accessible taverns. But just when they take to drink, prices and rents are raised to line government coffers. Bourgeois Ceylonese even make a major enterprise out of the Arak rental franchise and benefited greatly from the purchase of state auction liquor licenses. In 1904, a complicated young Ceylonese man is stirred by the passion of reviving Buddhism on the island and in the region. He has a growing belief in Buddhism's superiority to all other philosophies and even works day and night to help Western theosophists translate important Buddhist works. The man is Anagarika Dharmapala. He has changed his birth name from David to Dharmapala, meaning guardian of the Dharma. He is from a well-known southern industrial family and is schooled in the ways of the British. Together with others who identified as Buddhist nationalists, they start what would come to be known as the Temperance Movement or the Suravirodhi Vyaparya against state-sponsored alcoholism. By the end of this movement, out of 1,238 taverns across the island, only 190 remained. Anagarika Dharmapala is considered one of the key contributors to the revival of 19th century Buddhism that sought to bring ideological legitimacy to anti-colonialism. He did this by promoting an exclusive doctrine of Sinhala Buddhist superiority and was often derogatory to other religions, particularly those who practice Islam. He himself would never live to see a free and independent Ceylon. In fact, he would never draw his last breath on Lankan soil. But the movement leaves a deep impression on the populace. A growing Sinhala Buddhist resistance is seen as a rising civil threat to the empire's continuity in the country. Meanwhile, Hindu nationalists have also joined the anti-imperialist movement and are fighting for their identity. World War I in Europe is changing things rapidly. Allies' wartime propaganda rages on about the virtues of self-determination. British subjects, many of whom are fighting alongside the Allies, are making note of these messages for use in future arguments. In 1915 Ceylon, civil unrest between races is also at an all-time high. The majority of Ceylonese were Sinhalese Buddhist. Among the many minorities that made the island their home, there were two groups who practiced Islam, called the Moors. The Ceylon Moors, whose Arabian ancestors had settled in the island six centuries ago, were considered native to the island. Soon, a new group of Indian traders, sponsored and favored by the British, have ousted them in business and began increasing in number. This group, known as the Coast Moors, quickly established their trade, culture and religion throughout the country. 
Their power is growing. The Sinhalese nationalists are more motivated than ever to stop this growing influence. Among their grievances, the Sinhalese perceive that Moors increasingly control trade and commodity prices. Minor incidences of violence are recorded across the main cities. The year is 1913 in Gampola, central Ceylon. A group of coast Moors from the town have objected to a Buddhist perahara that was supposed to travel past their mosque in Kandy on the grounds of a noise ordinance. The perahara is a procession accompanied by fireworks, drum beating and pageantry and led by an elephant who carries an important Buddhist relic. The procession is of deep historical and cultural importance to the Buddhist. Referred to as tom-toms, the perahara drums are considered a disturbance and were regulated by the noise ordinance passed in 1865 under the Kandyan Convention or Udaratagivisuma that ended the Sinhalese monarchy. The colonial government had ordered that religious processions stop making any noise as it went past a place of worship. This is not exactly a helpful rule in a country where rambunctious pageantry and drum beating was a part of regular displays of devotion. Strike 1 the ordinance has rather indelicately been reinforced by an overzealous local British government agent who marks a perimeter around a local mosque and informs the Basnaya Ilame, the ceremonial head of the procession and chief lay custodian of the Temple of Kandy, that no musical instrument should be heard within this perimeter. Strike 2 the Basnaya Ilame stops right in the middle of his Perahara preparations. He thinks for a moment, then files action in the Kandy District Court. His argument, the government agent has violated the Kandy Convention. Helpfully for him, the district judge shares this view. But a certain attorney general at the time does not feel the same way. The Supreme Court reverses the decision. The Buddhists of Ceylon are defeated. The Kosmos are elated. Strike 3 Racial tensions are now beginning to boil over. It is just before midnight on May 28, 1915. The annual Perahara is passing through Kandy on an alternative route with a permit from the authorities and is held up by a group of coarse moors close to their mosque. Hostilities are exchanged and the procession decides to turn back. But a single unfortunate hoot rings out after the pilgrims in derision. Silence. Then rage. A swell of anger now escalates and the moors and pageant goers are embroiled in a violent fight that turns into a full-blown riot in the mosque. The very next day, angry Sinhalese mobs attack the Moorish bazaars in Kandy and what is thought to be preferential treatment towards a minority soon turns Kandy town into a scene of devastation. The British forces fail to contain the spread and intensity of violence. Misunderstanding the ethnic conflict as an uprising against the British Empire by the Sinhalese and seeking to protect the traders who facilitate their commercial interest, they overreact. Reinforcements are called for from Colombo and then trouble moves there. Reports of a young boy murdered at the hands of the coast moors spread and three days later, pockets of anti-Muslim riots erupt across many parts of the island and the country burns for nine days. Sinhalese and Moorish mobs exchange violent attacks on each other's homes and businesses. The 1915 riots would be a watershed moment for Sri Lanka. According to official estimates, the riot resulted in 116 deaths, 189 wounded, four incidences of rape and over 4,000 cases of reported looting while 17 mosques burned. The British, paranoid that the majority Sinhalese have banded together and organized an uprising, declare an unforgiving martial law. The state has again miscalculated the depth and tension that has built up between the races and engages lethal force, mostly on the Sinhalese. By June, Punjabi soldiers who were stationed on the island and many militia groups, some with no prior experience, are brought in to quell the violence in a response reminiscent of the British crackdown on the Martale Rebellion, nearly seven decades prior. Hundreds of civilian Sinhalese are arrested without charge and shot in the streets. Some are flogged in public. The governor of Ceylon, Robert Chalmers, is paranoid of the civil uprising. While he and his administration are later chastised for their excessive use of force, they unleash horror on the citizens. The period would be called 100 Days of Terror under the British. The government also jails several prominent Ceylonies of the temperance movement without charge, some of whom will go on to play important roles in Ceylon politics, including the future Prime Minister of Independent Ceylon. Also arrested were the brothers of Anagarika Dharmapala, Edmund and Dr. Charles Heva Vitharana. 
Dharmapala himself had his legs broken and would be confined to Jaffna, while his brother Edmund would die there. Among those executed was 27-year-old Captain Henry Pedris, a well-loved young socialite and militia officer. Pedris was arrested on a charge of incitement of riots, which were later proven false. It is said that he walked to his execution chamber with his head held high. He requested that he wanted to be shot by Asians, not by European Christians, and was obliged. He takes the high chair and quietly places his own handkerchief over his eyes after refusing the one offered to him and said, I am ready, as he faced the men of the 28th Battalion of the Punjabi Regiment. The events of 1915 also leave prolonged mistrust between ethnicities. The brutality of the executions and the thought of patriots languishing in jail was too much for many Ceylonese. This set in motion a series of events from which the state could not turn back. A time bomb was ticking on the British Empire and there was no kill switch in sight. Catch us next week on Patta History as we meet the revolutionary team who brought independence to Ceylon. Thank you so much for your support. Make sure to like, subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified of new episodes.